<laughs> if you've been partying like me, uh, this is still very early in the morning. So thank you for being here today to uh, witness my discussion over the next uh, 60 or 59 minutes, something like that. Anyway, hi, I'm Randall Schwartz. I am, uh, some of you may know me from uh, various venues. Let me talk about what those might be. How many people here listen to the Floss Weekly podcast? Anybody here? Nobody. All right. Oh, over there. Okay, in the corner. We've got one in the corner. How many people here uh, have heard of Pearl, the programming language? There we are. Oh, much more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you might know, if you, if you didn't raise your hand, you might not know that I wrote the top five selling books on Pearl. So uh, that was my claim to fame in the 90s. But you got to keep reinventing yourself as days move on. And I am all in on Dart now, which is what you're here to hear about for the next hour. Um, I also have been at DragonCon 13 out of the last 15 years, so I'm very happy to be back again. I had to miss last year because of a minor incident involving uh, being in a hospital for a while, so that was bad. Uh, but I'm here. I'm here today. So, um, how many people saw the parade? Did you go to the parade? Anybody here? Cool. I, I've never seen the parade in all the times I've been here. I just know what happens, that's all. Because I'm never up early enough to see the parade. So that's pretty much my list there. Okay, so let's talk. Let's do it. I believe Google's Dart should be your next language, and why? TLDR, top level, because Google's making money with it. I mean, lots of money. So, how does Google make money? Mostly, they make it by ads. Over a billion dollars a month flows through AdSense and AdWords. Starting about a year ago, well, actually about six months ago, those were rewritten in Dart. They'd previously been in Google uh, Web Toolkit. Uh, which was basically Java compiled for client side. All right. Also, Green Tea, that's an internal tool. We don't get to see that, but it's their way of managing their customer relations. So, Google is behind Dart. They're absolutely behind Dart. They're not going to abandon it like they have a bunch of other things. Okay, anyway, <laughs> these are all in Dart. That's the important thing. And what I like about that is I got a pull quote from um, uh, one of the people talking about converting uh, AdSense over. Compared to our old GBT workflows in Java, we see much faster iteration. Compiling and starting the server is about eight times quicker than it used to be. I mean, think about your development time. You know, how long are you spending waiting for the compiler, waiting for the, 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 the thing to refresh and stuff, right? Tech leads have shipped products that are estimated two times improvement in overall project speed. Um, and AdSense is about 160,000 lines of code, and they were able to rewrite that in Dart in a fairly amount of time. Yeah, again, AdSense AdWords, both formally in Google Web Toolkit, uh, uh, which was Java. Okay, where does it run? And this is one of the things that really excites me about Dart. It runs server-side. Imagine Node.js, which a lot of you probably use if you're here in this conversation. Uh, but with threads, it actually works. So you have multiple, you, you, you have eight cores in your machine, you can use all eight cores. Okay, it also, even includes shebang scripts. So you could have pound bang user bin dart and it just works. Um, there's some limitations to that, but it's not bad. Okay. You can also compile the binaries, which means that you can have all the code pre compiled and run it automatically, which is nice. And here's what I like browser side. Okay. Browser side. All modern browsers. Uh, the primary toolkit for browser side is Angular. Uh, it used to be connected up with the Angular JS project, but now it's just Angular Dart. And the reason is that there's some things that you have to do in JavaScript that are trivial or not even needed on the Dart side. So they decided to work the project. Um, also though, as you're doing it on the browser side, you have full JavaScript interoperability. So you want to pull in a classic um, uh, JavaScript library, or you can pull that in and interop with it. It's really nice. So server side, browser side, what else? Flutter. Flutter allows you to write one code base for both iOS and Android. This is exciting. Unlike, say, uh, React Native, where at some point you're probably talking to a DOM, the Flutter, I'll talk more about this later, but Flutter allows you to talk directly basically to a canvas. So all of your widgets are native Dart. It means you can extend it, you can fix it, you can enhance it, things like that. And the best part about Flutter is hot reload. So what that means is 
I'm in the middle of testing my app on my phone, and I see that it actually have been blue instead of green. I go into my code base, and I change the color blue to green. And then I hit hot reload on my debugger, and it only ships over and compiles the parts that changed. And then I, I refresh on my screen, it's done. I'm still in the middle of the state wherever I was. It's amazing. It's better than any other solution in this space. So if you're writing mobile apps, you should be really looking at Flutter. <coughs> and also, um, I can't talk much about this because it's not very public yet, but Fuchsia is possibly the next uh, replacement for Android, uh, maybe the replacement for um, uh, like Google Home, things like that, any IoT sort of thing. So Dart and Flutter is already in there. Okay, so that's the, that, that's the short version. You can all leave now if that's all you want to hear. Okay, but let me talk more about what's going into it. Okay, so it's a modern language developed on the shoulders of all the existing languages. Strong type safety, it has generics, typing of aggregates. You can say that this list can only contain numbers and it enforces that. Baked into the language, promises and streams. Uh, async gateway, if you're used to that in JavaScript, uh, modern JavaScript, stuff like that. Built in isolates. Isolates are cool because they turn into threads on servers. So you can have an application that consumes all the cores of your machine. But it's sheer nothing isolates. So there's no locking, there's no worrying about, you know, ordering things like that. Basically, you send data back and forth from the isolate to the main and so on. And, but those also map into the uh, web workers in the browser. So the same language for server side and client side using the technology of isolates can work in both ways. We can do annotations with reflection. There's amazingly good IDE support already. And this is pretty much across the, the spectrum. Atom, IntelliJ, VS Code, WebStorm, they all understand Dart. And it's so fun being able to just say, okay, I'm going to type this variable name, dot, and then it says, oh, what do you want to call as a method on that? And it lists it all correctly there. So very nice stuff, very nice support in all the modern uh, IDEs. Even Emacs, but I didn't list it though. I wonder if I didn't list it. Okay, go ahead. Emacs works All right, even Emacs. Uh, it has an active community. So the, uh, for me, the CPAN was one of the biggest attractions to Perl that we have all these people contributing all over the world to various things. But pub is what they call it. Well, pub is because it's sort of like in the theme of darts. Pub, get it? So pub. Pub, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of dart-related jokes inside. So the pub, though, has thousands of packages already. Something like 31,000 last time I looked, okay? It also has active Gitter channels, mailing lists, so that you can get answers right away. I hang out there a lot. Uh, and also, many of the main Googlers also hanging out there, which is really cool because you're getting to talk to the guys who are actually developing this stuff. So it's really kind of fun. Um, and one of the things they do on that on those channels is they encourage that you ask for question and get answers on Stack Overflow. So those questions get answered real quickly. But it's also good because you have this you now this history of people asking questions, getting answers on it, very very public. Stack Overflow is really good for that. Um, the code is actually controlled by an ECMA standard. So early on, a couple of years ago, they actually went all the way through the, uh, the ECMA standard group and they got it as being an external standard. So it's not just Google. This is not, uh, although Google's behind it, they're not the only ones contributing to it. They're not the guys in charge, ultimately, right? Sources on GitHub gets community commits. It's nice. So people are actually actively developing the language, not just Google, right? And one of the things I really like is that they have this thing called DartPad. So, you know, there's the JSBin and a bunch of other things for JavaScript. DartPad lets you actually go up and type in some Dart code and play with it right there live and share it with people so that you can say, what's wrong with this code or why isn't this working the way I want it to? And that works both for command line stuff and for um, uh, web-based stuff. It can all be built in DartPad. Really fun. So what's the language actually look like? Well, it's pure object-oriented. Everything inherits from object. I like this because I'm an old 
old, old, old school small talker. And a lot of the people from small talk worked on dark. And this is one of the parts I like about it. So everything inherits from object. Um, you have top level functions, class and instance methods, lambdas, even nested functions. Like that was sort of fun. You can define a function inside a function, and it's local only that function, in case you need assistance like that. And also very simple scoping rules. Unlike you know private, and friend, and all those are categories from Java and stuff like that. If it's underscore, it's private. That's it. Very, very simple, okay. Full exception management, try, catch, finally, model language stuff, right? And it does scale well to large projects. And I think one of the things I really like is Google, you know, leaned back a bit and said, what do we hate about Java? <laughs> and made sure not to make any of those mistakes. So very little boilerplate. If you write the code, it works. Uh, from the article I quoted earlier, uh, Google estimates that it takes just about two weeks to get somebody spun up on job on, on Dart, if they knew Java or C Sharp or some other language is similar to that. Which means you're not going to spend a lot of time thinking about it. And my friend uh, Wim, um, who's now one of the Dart advocates uh, working for Google, he actually says, I, I, I was playing with Flutter and I didn't really even think about the code. I mean, I, I didn't really care about Dart, it just sort of works. And that, that's what I like about a language. If it's that simple, if it's that obvious how to do the coding, and all your real concern is about how to, you know, put a widget on a screen, it's it's a very productive language. Very familiar syntax, typed parameters, optional parameters can have defaults. Very simple fat arrow notation. Again, drawing a lot from JavaScript and uh, Java to be able to define the language. Uh, small talk like cascades. So cascade in small talk is sending the same, sending different messages to the same object. Uh, but small talk actually got it wrong uh, because if you put a small talk at all, you know that every once in a while you have to say yourself at the end because you have to get the original object back. Dart does it the other way. So Dart returns the original object always, which is really nice. So finally, we got it right. Uh, I thank Gila Braga for that, for actually getting it right for me. Thank you. Uh, getters and setters have the same syntax as member access. So what this means is that I can start with a normal member variable, and I can then later have a getter and a setter for it, and I don't have to change the rest of my code. This is the same dot syntax. So we'd have to change that for one or the other. Uh, assignment operators, familiar operators, and batteries included. It comes with full, mature libraries for all sorts of things. So this, is, this is not even going to pub. This is just what's included when you download the SDK. Async, collections, convert, so on. All sorts of wonderful stuff. And additional solutions to get in the pub. Um, what's also cool about that is that the build tool can take a URL for like a GitHub uh, repository, and it will just work. <laughs> so we'll say, I'm going to go out and get the latest version of this from the GitHub, and I'll put that as part of your code. Okay. So let's look a little bit more at the language. Again, very simple, recognizable. Here we go. Print a number. So there's the definition of the function. Uh, it takes a parameter, a number, which is a num. Num is basically a number, right? And it prints it. Very simple. I mean, this is easy code to recognize, right? And then we have a main. Every program has a main, like C does. And we're going to assign 42 to the number. We're going to call print number. That's it. I mean, this is this is dark. This is very simple, easy to understand. So the important concepts, again, everything's an object. Typing used to be optional, but starting in version 2, which is coming out, Soon, I can't say when, but soon, uh, typing is no longer optional. Everything's going to be strongly typed. Uh, it's compiled completely before execution or translation of JavaScript. And again, functions can either be top level, like we saw an example of a moment ago, or functions can be nested functions or class or instance methods. Variables can be top level, or they can be class variables or instance variables. And again, very simple scoping. Underscore means private to a library. 
Non underscore means it's global, public. Anybody can talk to it. So variable. Here's a variable name equals Bob. Now, what's interesting about this statement is I didn't tell the compiler that that had to be a string. But because of type inferences, it automatically knew that. It defers, or it, it infers that Bob can only be a string, therefore the name can only be a string. So I don't need to annotate that variable to say this is a string variable only. Okay? And variables are initially null, so null is a special value. We can also create final variables and const variables that can't be changed. So for example, if I said final name equals Bob, then if I then said name equals something, it would be a compile time error, because it knows that this value is only going to be once. Const bars, 100,000, right? Const, you can multiply constants together, and it comes out with the constant. So the difference between final and constant, final is lazily computed which means that if it's part of a initialization, it will be only run when we actually access the variable. But const, of course, is computed at compile time, and it can only be made up from constant expressions. Uh, Built-in types covers the usual gamut. We've got uh, num, which is basically floating point. Uh, well, num is both int or double. So num is the superset then of int and double. Int, of course, int. Double is double precision and floating point. Uh, in the browser, int unfortunately is restricted to the JavaScript ints. So two of the 56, something like that. But on server side, it's actually infinite precision. So you can have, you know, two to the millionth power, and that would be a valid int. Strings, booleans, lists and arrays, maps. Full Unicode's, Unicode support, so runes, what they call it in Dart, which is sort of a weird name, but there we go, runes. So integers have no decimal point and are infinite precision. So we can have huge numbers, uh, x numbers, 0x. Again, there's nothing surprising in the Dart language. It's really like everything else you've seen. The important part about Dart, and the reason I'm excited about it, is the five platform execution. Really big int, right? Number includes decimal point, it's a double. We can call int.parse to take a string and turn it into an integer. We can call double.parse and turn it into a floating point number. We can say to string. Well, it's a little weird, it's like one dot. What, how's that work? But it works. Everything is an object, so everything takes a dot and a method name following it. So it works nicely that way. And pi. To, uh, um, to string is fixed, 2, which is going to be actually just turn it to 3.14. Bit shifting is available, traditional, right? And internally, strings are UTF-16 code units, so we have full Unicode support, not a problem. And single and double quotes are identical, just use your choice. So S1 is a single quoted string, S2 is a double quoted string, but there's no difference in how they're interpreted inside. You just have to escape the string delimiter if you need to use it inside the string, or just switch to the other one. String interpolation uses dollar, so there's my name. Dollar $s is here, it would be Randall is here. And uh, dollar open curly expression close curly is going to be evaluated inside the string. I'll turn into that. Uh, if you want the string to be interpreted literally, you use an R in front of it. Uh, you can concatenate strings just by having adjacent strings, so quote foo quote, quote bar quote, which we'll would be foo bar. Or you can use plus, which is a little weird, but yeah. That's because, again, people going from JavaScript, expect that to work, so of course that's going to work in, in there. Um, triple quotes for multi-line strings, so that would be for documentation strings, things like that. So a list, an array, looks like JavaScript lists, square brackets, one, two, three. Again, the compiler, as it's looking at this, says, oh, all of those are integers. So we're actually going to define that in list as list of int. And that means if you wanted to add a floating point number to this list, it would actually reject it. But you can actually get a list of any number by adding an annotation. So if I said list sub uh, num, 
that's going to add the annotation for list to just being uh, a list of any number, which means now I can add a floating point number. Okay. You can also put num in front like that, so that's also another way to say, hey, this looks like they're all integers, but really I want to be able to have a numeric list. I want to have any possible numbers in here. Uh, element access, trailing square brackets, zero base. So if I looked at list sub two, that would be the number three. Or, or I'm actually updating it first, so I'm changing it to 17, and then I'm printing that, so that means it's going to take from three to 17. We also have constant lists. So I can say const one, two, three. Pretty much the same as the first one, but that means it's going to be not changeable, right? So altering any element of that list, or even the list itself, is going to be rejected. All sorts of traditional methods, again, a full language. So we're looking at possibly, you know, uh, add, add all, index of, things like that. Sort, uh, Schwartzian sort, probably. Yeah, okay, nice. Okay, maps, also called hashes in Perl. Uh, they look like JavaScript objects, key value pairs. So we have, for example, GIFs can have, you know, first, second, and fifth and the values are cartridge, troll dots, and golden rings, which are there. And again, type inference is happening. So this says that we are actually constructing a map that has string keys and string values. It figures that out by looking at the values you've handed it this time. Same square bracket notation to access. So square brackets again are going to pull out things. So gifts sub first is going to be partridge because it's going to go in and use the, the square brackets. By the way, the square bracket um, access and the square bracket assignment are overloadable operators. So you can add code in your class to actually say, this is what happens when I use these square brackets. Very cool. Give sub eight, made some milk. The type of a map key can be any object. So it doesn't have to be just a string, like it is in Perl or Ruby. It can be any object you want. Uh, an object <coughs> equality which you can also define in your class. If you have a particular class and you define equality, that's what's going to be used for the uniqueness. If you ask for a key that's not there, you get back null for the value. And there's a special method call that says, don't uh, return this if it's not there, rather than return null. Functions, again, first class objects, they can be assigned to variables or passed around to other functions. So for example, is noble, Give it the atomic number, go into my private variable noble gases, and pass it the atomic number, and see if that's not null. Very simple. You can also write it as a, uh, an arrow function. These two are exactly the same. Uh, is noble, pass it atomic number, and return back then the value of noble gases atomic number. Is that not null? You can have optional parameters. Position or name with defaults. So here's a uh, here's enable flags, and the curly braces around here means that we're defining two named parameters. Okay, and so we would uh, we could also say, well, if bold is not passed, it's always going to be false. If hidden is not passed, it's always going to be true. And there are the defaults as indicated. So very again. Nothing surprising in the language. I employ haven't shocked you at all. It's, pre it's a pretty boring language. It's a good language, though. Right? It just works. Every application, again, has a main entry point. And for command apps, uh, command line apps, it receives the arguments. So this is the formal definition of main, is that it takes a list of arguments, and they're all strings. Okay. Very rich set of operators. Again, nothing surprising. 15 levels of precedence. Pre-increment, post-increment, pre-decrement, post-decrement. Uh, we can do type testing. We say, is this a string? Is this a whatever? So if an argument uh, was originally declared as dynamic or object, we want to figure out what it actually is, we can ask. Uh, we can also cast objects with as. We have compound assignments, a plus or equals, or plus equals three, so that's incrementing a by three. Get bitwise operators like and, and bit left shift, things like that. Uh, if then else, question mark colon from any modern languages with JavaScript and Perl and a few others. Traditional control flow, similar again. Once again, nothing surprising language, C and JavaScript. 
if else, for loops, while, do while, switch in case, um, assert, which is kind of cool, assert, you can say, is this value true, and if not, complain. And what's nice about that is, again, when it compiles it for production, it eliminates those. So this is only for debugging, only for compile time, testing. Yeah, just leaves. Um, exceptions, traditional exception hierarchies available. Um, and thank goodness, unlike Java, we had to always figure out, okay, this can possibly throw these things and catch these things. Just, you just catch them. There's no, there's no decoration. Um, exceptions typically will subclass from either the built-in error class, the built-in exception class, but really you can throw anything. You just throw a string, just throw whatever, right? And the traditional try, catch, finally. So you can have uh, something that looks for particular elements and, uh, and does something based on those, or rethrow those if you don't want to handle that. Uh, an exception handlers can also ask for stack inspection. So that means you could print a good debugging message that says, I was called from here, from here, from here, that, uh, and this is why we got this exception. Everything is an instance of a class. Everything's an object, right? Ultimately inheriting from the, quote, object class. <coughs> Single inheritance, but allows mix-ins. So what that means is that you can define an interface with a class and mix that in, provide both implementation and a protocol from a mix-in. Uh, use the new keyword, so that's very similar to Java, with a class name or a class method. However, I've been whispering into my ear that new is going to be optional, just to reduce some of the noise. You know, from small talk, we didn't need new all the time. We just gave a class method and it worked. But uh, apparently now they're fixing Dart to do the same thing. So objects, of course, have members, and that's consisting of uh, methods that belong to the object and instance variables. And classes can be abstract, so we can say, I don't really ever want to create an instance of this. I just want to have this be a protocol, an interface, that I want to mix in to classes. So that gives us the hierarchy that way. Um, and many of the operators can be overridden for a particular class. So you can define what plus means, or what times means, or what minus means, or what uh, member setting means as part of your protocol of classes. Okay. Uh, so dot is used for both methods and instance variables, one, sy one a syntax for both. So for example, let's define a class for point that has an x and a y. We'll define an uh, instance method inside this class, two string, that prints point x, y. Two string is actually a special name. It actually is what's used every time you interpolate it into a string. So if we have a main where we say point is a new point, point dot x is 4, point dot y is 7. So that's accessing the member variables x and y. We print that, it's going to call the toString method, which again is going to print point four comma seven. Straightforward code. And getters and setters, like I said, can be defined for instance variables. That allows for transparent migration from it being originally a member variable over to it having a special getter and setter, which is really nice. Class variables, class methods also support. So asynchronous operations, again, similar to the promise libraries in modern JavaScript. Provides, for example, future, which is uh, one value soon, but not now. And stream, which is many variables over time, with operations like yield to generate streams of data. And you can use try, catch, and finally. And for very simple cases, the async stuff can be made to appear non-async, for example. If we just have an async keyword in the first line of our server team, then we can use the word await inside our script, inside our program, inside our uh, function. And that will actually then yield the thread over and over again until lookup version finally returns a value. Okay, so if it's the expected version, then do something else, do something else. Okay, okay. so uh, again, this is modeled and stolen from modern JavaScript. So it's nothing new again. It's just the dark guys are just doing the same thing everybody else is doing. Right? Very nice. Uh, on the server side, 
We can put executables. We can activate it, and it adds it to a global bin directory. So, for example, I can just type foo now, and it just works. You can invoke directly from the command line to the shell. And as I said earlier, that isolates are mapping to threads automatically. On the web side, which is, again, what first interested me in Dart, but actually is not the most important story I, I've now learned. So originally, there was a shared code base. Uh, Angular inside Google is very important. And so they had a team on Angular uh, that was originally generating both Dart code and JavaScript code. But now the Dart team is now separate. So it's its own code. Uh, Folk in late 2016 to that. And the reason for it being native Dart is there were some things that JavaScript needs in terms of their framework, and Dart didn't need it. Better performance. And also, the Dart Angular team is working very closely with the Dart compiler team to get precisely the things they need to make it work good. Right? And again, used in production by many companies, including Google. Uh, Angular 4, I think, just got released yesterday day before yesterday. So, really cool stuff. So Angular is great. Angular is a very performant uh, web interface. If you're building web apps that work on all modern browsers, Angular is definitely something to look at. But what I'm most excited about right now is Flutter. And Flutter is Dart on mobile. So it allows you to build fast, beautiful mobile apps. Unlike a lot of the other cross-platform things, where you have to either write code in both uh, Objective-C and Java, or you have to write in JavaScript, and then it gets compiled down to both of those. Flutter is unique in that it actually takes the Dart code that you write and cross-compiles it to Objective-C, and cross-compiles it to Java, and then builds ARM from that, ARM code from that. So that means it's running high performance. The other thing that's really cool is that it talks directly to uh, basically a canvas. So rather than having uh, OEM widgets like uh, the, uh, the stuff that's on Android the, 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 uh, for, for building a widget and the stuff that's on iOS for that, it actually, the code for the, what you're seeing on the screen is entirely in Dart. There's two advantages to that, which is that you can customize it. You can say, I don't exactly like the way this widget works. I want to have borders around it when I'm moving it around or whatever, right? You can just simply do that. Um, the other advantage of that is that you don't have to wait for um, updates to, the, to iOS or Android. You just simply write your widget, and there is the widget the way you want it to. Dark code is compiled ahead of time to native ARM code. There are plugins for a number of the things to access, so, so for specific APIs. Uh, you can also have abstract interfaces for cross-platform. Uh, the layout system is very responsive. Uh, it's, 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 it's amazing. You know, you start scrolling in one of these Dart apps, and it's just amazing. Because each widget type actually owns its own layout strategy, and that means there's no need for a virtual DOM abstraction layer, which again, all this is just it, it's it's game changing. If you're looking at Flutter for our, for mobile apps, amazing. But probably the most amazing part of that is Hot Reload. So I was talking about earlier. Um, you basically can say I wanted this to be green instead of blue, and so you type green and then you hit a button, and within a fraction of a second, your phone is already showing that it's being green instead of blue. You don't have to go back to the same set of steps in your app to try to get back there again. It just works. Really, really awesome. It, it, mind blowing. Um, and Fuchsia, I can't talk much about this because it is open source. There's a GitHub repository for it, and people have figured this out that they could actually build this thing and play with it on their phone. But it's being developed sort of in mystery, so I can't tell you more than that. It's been speculated, though, to be perhaps a possible Android replacement. Why is that interesting? Because one of the things that Google struggles with is that they're tied into Linux release cycles. And it also means they have to do uh, complete testing to be able to release new OS. They don't actually really own Android. I mean, it's like they're subject to everything else. And it's also Java, but that's another thing. 
Uh, actually, it's the next point. So it also would eliminate Google's dependence on Java. Uh, if Fuchsia is being written entirely as a microkernel plus Flutter, then we don't have to worry about Java anymore. Um, there is a lawsuit still in place uh, from uh, Oracle to try to get a lot more money out of Google. <coughs> Google. Google has big pockets, so yeah, Oracle wants some of their money. So if we get rid of Java entirely, we're good, right? Uh, and it's a great operating system because it's small. It seems much smaller than Android for the Internet of Things. So imagine your next Google Home device running Fuchsia instead of running uh, whatever it's running now, right? Uh, the current release can be played with, but it's not entirely useful, uh, but people figured it out. You know, people outside of Google have actually played with this. Uh, and again, the UI entirely in Dart and Flutter. Uh, so that's very cool. Right, so for more information, the uh, homepage for everything Dart related is dartlang.org. You can actually play with it, right? your first Dart program right in the browser at dartpad.dartlang.org. Um, as I said earlier, I, I do a podcast called Floss Weekly, and we've actually had uh, three different instances where they've talked about it. Uh, I initially had Seth Ladd on, a uh, very cool guy. Uh, he's one of the Dart advocates, and he was on talking about Dart in general, which is my first experience with Dart. This is about uh, five years ago, I think, right now. Uh, Casper Lund uh, was on, on one of my later shows, <coughs> on Show 362, and he it was amazing hearing how he's thinking about Dart and how he develops it <coughs> that way. Uh, but most recently, just like maybe three months ago, I had Adam Barthon, who is the Flutter lead developer, talking about mobile and why mobile's important and why Dart's important to mobile. So that's the, uh, those, those shows I would recommend you go watch. Uh, also, but just start, go to Dart Lane, find out more, everything you want to do. I finished. 20 minutes early. Hi. Uh, questions, please. <coughs> Could you compare and contrast to Scala? Scala is interesting. Um, I'm... Scala doesn't run in five platforms. That'd be the quickest way to say why Dart's more important. But if you're only doing things server-side, yes, yeah, Scala's interesting. Uh, I don't know I don't know a lot about Scala, so I can't say much more than that. I have a quick question. Uh, we, got a, we got a mic, sorry. Uh, yeah, let's wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Thank you. My question is, uh, what do you think about Kotlin's, is basically? Kotlin's? Uh, Kotlin's it's been around for a while, obviously, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Kotlin's interesting. Uh, again, it's. I think the thing that's exciting for me about Dart is that it's cross-platform. Kotlin's going to be great to get away from Objective-C, uh, uh, no, no, sorry, the Android side, so to get away from the Android programming. But I think if you learn Dart, rather than spending your time learning Kotlin, now all of a sudden you're iOS and Android. I think the cross-platform uh, mobile apps are the future. Please. So I, I teach CS. And every time uh, I introduce my students to a new language, uh, I want them to focus on the actual development and not buggy tool support or immature tool support. So how good is, is that for Dart? The tooling is very mature. It's, it's amazing. And the fact that it's like six or seven different platforms. You get WebStorm, you get IntelliJ, you get uh, um, Atom has support for it, uh, VS Code. Everything is already really good. Because what they did about a year ago is they moved the analyzer code, which allows you to have things like code completion and code highlighting, things like that. They moved it to an app that had a good API. And so all of these apps now have come forward and are using this. And it's, it's really amazing, really fun to be able to just, you know, type an expression and a dot, and it goes, oh, this is what this is. Here's what you want to complete it to. Or rewrite this subroutine as an arrow expression subroutine instead of uh, a full expression. Very good sport, very mature, all the way across the board. Yeah. And how, uh, how ready for prime time is Flutter? They call it alpha. But when they call it alpha, and yet there are already numerous applications for both the iOS and the Android stores with that. And including, actually, the, the guys that uh, did the Hamilton app, so that you know Hamilton, the Broadway show, uh, they wanted to get something out quickly. 
and they used Flutter to develop that app. They developed it in three months. And so that tells you first how good the tooling is, but also that now there's an app in the App Store that you can download for Hamilton. They can get you uh, cheap tickets and things like that. Uh, and it's all, in, it's all in Flutter. It's all in Flutter. There's another really good app that I use almost every day called News Voice. And what's great about News Voice is that they use the same technology for their iOS and Android apps as they did for their web app. So a lot of shared technology. So you go to their website, it looks just like the the iOS and Android apps. It's just it's amazing how it's cool coming it's from the land of the decade long beta. Though. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like how long was how long? There are many things that were in beta for years. Yeah, yeah. no, but uh, I, I I can also <coughs> I can't really say if I could say though I would say it's also very committed to internally in, at at Google. So. I can't actually say that, but yeah. And so it, it, this is, it, it, yes, it's called alpha, but it's only because they might want to change something. Have they considered rebasing on Angular 2.0? It looks like you said Angular JS. Um, the Angular Dart team is now always going to be separate from the Angular JS team. Uh, there are some things that happen. Well, Angular 2 JS was very close to what the Dart team forked from. So it's it's more the Angular 2 than it is Angular 1. And but Angular Dart has its own path now. Yeah, 1.5 is a little bit closer to 2. They took some of that feature. So. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's but it, it's it's very mature. They're doing some amazing things with it, yes. Anybody else? Questions? I see no hands going anywhere. So oh, 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 Other than Pusho, what things about Dart make it an IoT goodness? Hmm. I think one of the things that makes it interesting, and I didn't mention this yet, is that when the compiler is analyzing your code to build the product, it does <laughs> tree shaking. And what that means is it analyzes all the subroutines you call and then all the subroutines those call, and all the subroutines those call, and only includes that code in your output. So you can mention a huge library that has thousands and thousands of things, but if you only call three of those, that's all you get in the output. And so this is, uh, uh, you know, one, one, one way to uh, understand this is like if anybody here uses jQuery, you have to send the entire jQuery code down to your browser always, because you don't know what's getting called inside of it. But with uh, Dart, the only JavaScript that gets thrown at your browser is exactly what you need and no more. Very, very cool. So that's part of why IoT is interesting with this because it means on a small device, I'm only sending down the code that I need. Yeah. Cool. Good question. Any other questions? Oh, here. Yeah. So, for Fuchsia, is there, are there any targets, targets that like uh, at Dellum, uh Processors or ESP32 processors. Well, the, the IoT. We we know it's on ARM because it works on ARM, but I don't know what else. Okay. Yeah, I, and nobody knows. I mean, the, the thing about the Fusion project, which is really interesting, is that uh, Google's very close to the chest on this. They put it on GitHub, and there are commits being made to it pretty much every day, but we have no idea where it's headed. Uh, but so far, it looks like a possible Android Android replacement. It looks like it might just be IoT. But the only thing we really know is it runs Flutter. It runs Dart and Flutter. And it's, and it's got a microkernel. That's, that's it. It's not Linux. Yeah. Uh, you, quick question on the server side stuff. So it, um, if, I, if I understand it, just it compiles down to an executable? Or uh, is it like a daemon executable, a server uh, process? Uh, it's not quite like Go, if that's what you're comparing it to. It does need the VM. But it's basically a pre-compiled snapshot binary. So, and there's already like Docker images for this. In fact, you can run it in Google Cloud, that sort of stuff. So basically, it builds it down to a, an executable that is well, it's a snapshot. But it does need the VM sitting alongside of it. So it is, um, it is uh, platform specific at that point. Yep. Anybody else? Well, thank you all for coming. Have a great rest of the con. Thank you.